Thanks very Brilliant. much. Brilliant. Lovely. Well, as Dennis said, that, uh, uh, Jeff said, um, that was a film called Blind. Uh, it's a loop which I made out of my collection of film stills. I, I made it actually out of curiosity. I made it t blindly, you might say, because I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen. It had always occurred to me it would be an interesting thing to, to, to do would be to take my entire film still collection and sort of animate it, project it at 20, 24 frames a second, like cinema, return it to cinema in a way, film stills. And um, so I did it recently. Uh, and uh, I was quite astonished by the effect because I thought it was going to be the opposite, a sort of purgatorial blindness that was going to take over. It was going to be the opposite of what I normally do with my work. Because more, normally, my, my, my work is about redeeming the, the image, the restless, flowing image, and bringing it back to the, so that one can con contemplate it. And I imagine, so I imagine that this, this sort of the blind would be an experience of blindness. But I was curious. I didn't know what was happening. But actually, after seeing it a few times, I became more, became more and more fascinated by it visually as a phenomenon in itself. So also, I, I noticed that there's an interesting anecdote. My, my, um, Jake Miller, who runs the gallery that, I, that represents me in London, um, came to see it at my studio. And he, he said, God, it's amazing, John. Um, the only thing is, um, I'm a little uncertain about all the swastikas. Um, and I, didn't, I hadn't noticed any swastikas, actually. But we went through the whole film, all just however many thousand images. We found four swastikas somehow that he'd managed to see. And the following week, uh, and I took them out, not wanting to offend anybody. Um, the following week, my German agent, Giza the Capitan, came over. And she said, almost identically, she said, oh, wonderful, John. We have to show this in, in Cologne. Um, I, it's amazing how the nudity stands out. <laughs> and then I thought, aha, this is a strange cipher. Because, in fact, there was no nudity. All the, all the images come from the 1940s and 50s. So the, clo the closest you get to that is maybe a bikini. But, um, so I began to realize that everyone sees a different film. This is rather interesting to me because at 1 24th of a second, we are technically supposed to be blind to the image. You cannot see an image at that speed. It's too fast for us. Um, but somehow we do see something. But each time we see something, every time I look at this film, I see something completely different. Every time you look at it, you see something different. So I began to realize I had hit on the sort of cinema of discontinuity, you might say. Because in fact, I, which in a way was partly why I made the film in the first place, to, to point out a condition of blindness. Because in a strange way, even we live in a culture of image overload, of excess images, but of images that we're somehow actually blind to, because they, they pass us by too fast for us to, to actually take them in um, consciously. So there is no reflect, ability to reflect upon images. It's the opposite. Um, there's a, um, Makia Eliad, an ethnologist, one point, once pointed out that in sacred culture there are very few images, but they're attended to with great intensity and fascination. But in profane cultures, we have an excess of images, and we, we have a very little relationship with those images. Um, they're reduced always to, in cinema, for example, we're always waiting for the next. We never get kind of catch up with the image. The image is always one step ahead of us. We're always one step behind. We're always following. We're always, and in a way, it's a bit like language. We, we follow the legible links. So it, you might say that the image is everywhere, but everywhere it's in chains. It's in chain to narrative, to language, and to temporality, to this, this succession, so this sense of succession. Um, so in general, my collecting activities have been to do with somehow redeeming the image from legibility, if you like, from flow, to confront something other in the image than its transparency. Um, I think of it as a kind of opacity, a mystery that's at the heart of images themselves. But somehow you, 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 you have to remove or have to distance yourself from the ostensive representation to achieve. Sometimes this happens all on its own. I have a massive image collection. And one of the thing, first things I do whenever I contact a new image source is I always say, do you have any unwanted, damaged, or anonymous images? Those are the, 
anonymity and damage are the two things that disqualify film memorabilia from having any value to a collector. And those are the things that attract me the most. Anonymous actors are, are my favorite because they don't have those associations that you have to deal with in, the, in terms of collage. Um, and damage, I often find, is j does whatever it is that I do in my work better than, than I can do. So there are j just occasionally, I come across these things which I call my, after Duchamp, I call my unassisted ready-mades, which I just find. Um, these are some of my, uh, the, the, these are very few out of a huge collection, you can imagine, but um, they're the most precious to me. I wouldn't part with these for anything. Um, I mean, j just strange things. This combination of anonymous models and the strange sort of effect of a ble bleaching activity on the background, together with a label coming through from behind, um, eating away at this, this image, gives it something strange to me. This one has always fascinated me. And it's amazing how little da um, damage is required to, to disqualify a thing as a collect collectible. For example, between the legs, that tiny little bit of emulsion missing is what is actually the damage to this piece. But somehow that connects with that shadow on the floor of the interconnection between the animal and, and the girl. And you're suddenly aware of all the dirt on the floor, which it actually isn't excrement, but you can't help but think of the association with excrement because of the missing bit. And then that begins to lead you into looking at her stockings, which look badly torn as though in a struggle with this animal to create this. And in no time, you've got this strange, strange image out of something that would have been quite familiar. And that's what I try and achieve in my work. But I, these I think of as my God-given images. They've come from elsewhere to me um, and they're my gifts so I don't sell these actually they don't get shown very much as a result of that um, more recently I've been collecting these uh, these are, uh, these are kind of graphic um, intrusions on the image which have been done for the sake of old magazines um, film magazines so if you want a portrait of a particular actor and the only thing you've got is one with somebody else then the other person has to vanish and there are various ways in which the, the other figure vanishes. I've got a collection of, of ones in which the women are vanishing, and I call them Echo. This is Echo 1, after the Narcissus and Echo myth, in which Narcissus' wrapped self in immersion leads to his unrequited love, Echo, fading away. So, this is actually the first. This is it, where it all began. This is actually the very first film still image, a part of a small cache of images that, that was found to me, not by myself, but by my girlfriend at the time, Rosetta Brooks, the writer. And she handed me a little pile of these images that she'd found in the German Institute. An interesting story, because it involved Sigma Pocket, but I don't think we've got time for that. Um, and I think she handed it me this way up, because I remember insistently putting it exactly that the wrong way up as it is on the mantelpiece and there it stayed this was 1972 and it took me five years between 1972 when i was an undergraduate student and 1977 when i mounted it as a piece to accept that this was enough to qualify as a work of art for me and in the meantime i'd done i'd been involved in a whole range of practice from political photo montage to hand, uh, to richter type enlargement, painting enlargement of the silk screen, a whole variety of things. And suddenly, at the, at the end of this, I destroyed all of that stuff has been lost, th thankfully. Um, but all that's left, interestingly, is this one piece which remained on the mantelpiece, overlooking this frenetic but pointless activity of my student days. And it's all that was left of my student days, by the way, which is an interesting thing. I thought of it, too, as a sort of kind of symbol of what, what I was going through, because through this inversion, the reflection becomes the dominant reality and makes the reality into a sort of reflection. So there's an inversion going on. There's a wonderful thing, piece in um, Maurice Blanchot's essay, um, Two Versions of the Imaginary, when she talks about the way that to, for image fascination, the image reflection, he talks about the reflection becoming master of the life 
it reflects. And this seemed to embody this idea for me, the idea that the reflection, the image, overtakes. It's, it, what he's talking about is the, way, the point at which an image ceases to be some transparent conduit to elsewhere and becomes something that you look at. And this, I realized, was what I was trying to get at. It was instead of using the image as something to look through the world at, the image as a thing in itself, in some way. What, what is that strangeness when you disconnect it from that transparent relationship with the world? So the first things that I started to experiment with in the late 70s were beheadings, which seemed to be the easiest way to remove the central content of such images. And it immediately dispersed your attention to all sorts of things you wouldn't particularly normally look at, the relationship between these two bodies, the sofa, etc. Um, this I call metamorphosis because somehow what was a, 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 a perfectly ordinary portrait suddenly becomes very strange. You notice that the, the lamp has got, is still wrapped up in cellophane. Um, and it becomes a sort of marriage between, between the chair and a, a dress, really. A metamorphosis I thought of as in terms of like a centaur figure, a kind of mutation of some sort. This one, I've realized, doesn't work digitally because there is actually a stain on that tie just towards the bottom. But the, somehow digitally it's being, it has cleaned the, 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 the tie. I was going to make the point about how, oh, you can just about see it at the bottom there. But um, how incidental details suddenly become the central focus by this displacement. I became particularly interested in the beheading process and, and using the teeth as a kind of marker. Um, the teeth are interesting because they are the points of our body that, that are only exposed in death, a skeletal, the skeleton expo that is exposed in life. And also that, that connection between the smile and the, and the kind of aggressive, the, the, the fact that teeth are, are used for, for eating. My wife, when she cuts with scissors, automatically seems to <laughs> chew with her mouth as well. Something I've noticed in a lot of people. And, and there is a connection between collage and, and the scissors, the actual motion. I've always preferred using scissors. I don't very often these days, it's mostly a knife. But um, particularly if I'm going around things, it has to be a pair of scissors. I love scissors. And there's something very, also very feminine about scissors, I think. Um, but equally, the, the idea, uh, of course, cutting up is a preparation for cons consumption. That's what we do when we eat. We, we cut and then we consume. So this is, a, this is what I'm doing in the work. I'm going through a process of very fundamental consumption. I'm staging a, an act of consumption. The other, eye, the other point of cutting that I tend to use a lot is, is the eye. And it was only when supervising a dissertation on the subject of traumatic images that I suddenly realized that, in fact, it was all the, the eye, the cutting of the eye thing is something that goes back to a tra trauma that occurred to me when I was about 16. and went to the arts lab in London and saw the Chien and the new and, um, eye cutting thing. I wasn't prepared for it. I mean, I'm sure you all know about the Salvador Dali Bunuel eye cutting bit, but I that happened without any preparation for me and remains one of the most traumatic images. I can't even see it reproduced on a page without a certain shiver going through me. And it occurred to me that's probably why the eye is such an important point. And also the surface of a photograph is very like the surface of an eye. That glossy. And of course, I couldn't resist doing the eye and the teeth in this one. <laughs> Yeah, this is sort of a, uh, all of these are what I call my image fragment collection. And this is the first image in, from 1976 of what I call the third person archive, uh, mainly because of this rather strange reconstituted third person of the distance. It's been painted in rather awkwardly. Um, we've got very little time. I don't know whether I can go into this in too much depth. There are various, it's, it's been published as a book by Koenig now, and um, there are various sections of this, this archive. The, 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 most of the images are about postage stamp size, and some of them go really, really tiny. Uh, it started with the, the corner figures, like 
that sort of figures from the corner of an image with the, the, the spectacle of what they were lo looking at missing. But gradually I moved further and further into the middle of the picture and then into the far distance. This is one figure in a, a whole collection, there's a whole section in the third person archive of figures that have seen the camera and have turned around to see the camera. This is one of my favourites. I don't know why, but he seems so pleased with himself. He's off somewhere, very important. and It's obviously just finished raining. And it's drying out wherever. Um, I have a, this is from the section of corners. But, but, but what qualified the, the inclusion of these figures for me was a kind of feeling of empathy with them. Strangely, they, they all come from one source, the Countries of the World, a magazine that was published in the 1920s and 30s. And it became a sort of encyclopedia of world geography. Um, so they come from the distant past, um, and they're also distant in terms of spatial relations. They're always looking down at a distance. So there's a sort of double distance. But what fascinated me about this double distance, and you can do it by looking at people actually at a distance from a hill, there's a kind of bond that you feel with people when you don't know them too well. When the, there's, you, there's just the barest contours of humanity. There is a kind of sense of empathy. And I mean, Alfonso Lingus calls it death-bound subjectivity. And I'm very convinced by this idea. I think it's a redemptive thing. It's a part of the image. There is a way in which, through the distance of the image, we can actually find a bond in, separa in our separation from one another. In our sort of... The, you, Alfonso Lingus refers to our mutual relationship with, with mortality, death, you might say. It's a sort of pathos. Recently, I bought this, I did a, a sequel called Crossing Over. Throughout this period, I've also been collecting similar figures from postcards. And this has led to a book called Crossing Over, in which the, it's not so much centered on the individual figure, but um, also, it, crossing over refers to the, the fact that I'm going from black and white into colour, into the post-war period, predominantly. But equally, I cross back to the Victorian era. It's a complicated book, but it's more about the gap between people, or the separation, rather than the individuals. And it's less about empathy. The other thing is I noticed that, or several critics have noticed, that there were no women in the third person archive. It was all men. And that was a deliberate choice because the contours of a female from that vantage point immediately betray the period. And I, I was interested much more in you know, the, the, the figure of the man was so totally universal. It didn't matter whether they were Victorian men, Edwardian men, 1920s, 30s, they all had much the same contour. The moment a, a female came into, into it like this, you know exactly as an Edwardian postcard, for example, and that this is a 1960s or 70s postcard. And so th th this is all about a kind of time travel, in a way, movement. And so the female became a lot more important in terms of... And it was about the gaps. It ended with a, a number of these sort of half figures. Anyway, that is my image fragment. That's half of what I do in my work. Uh, although actually numerically probably a great deal less than the number of collages I've produced. The collages on the other hand, and you could say that with the image fragments, in the end you end up with a rectangular frame, I think, so that it doesn't matter how much you do the you fragment, you always end up with something that is a rectangular um, photographic image. With the collages, the actual process of fragmentation becomes the central object of attention. The object, the, the loss, you might say, is, is, is centralized. The wound, the, the cut, whatever, becomes the object of attention. This is um, one, of, one of the earliest of um, my film still collages from 1979. It's actually lost. There's nothing like lost images to create a sort of fetish. This is one that was lost, but has now been found, actually. 
Um, I was very careless with my work in the past. I tended to distribute it at various galleries or with anybody who'd take them. I assumed they'd always look after them, but I realized that a lot of people just threw them away. Um, but anyway, some have returned. <laughs> I find myself looking out for them on auctions and things. This one I bought back, personally. <laughs> That's Faye Dunaway. Very unusual for me to use a well-known actress, but it was kind of... I just liked this idea of, of somehow this absent figure having this relationship with Faye Dunaway. I don't know. This is a very... Uh, yeah, I, there are two forms of cutting collage that, that I started with, and in fact, to, to de- right up to today, it hasn't really changed very much. There's the black ground ones, which tend to be human-shaped, and then there's the white ground ones, which tend to be geometric. I'm not quite sure why, but geometric ones don't seem to work with black. And, the, and the, uh, definitely the human-shaped ones definitely don't work with white. But anyway, they see, always seem to me to be different kinds of c- cuts and different kinds of absences. Blackness being, obviously, the lack of light. Whiteness being a kind of the blinding light, if you like. Another kind of absence through... And both of them were related to cinema. I called this right, ang- uh, this a- right angle cut um, inserts. This was the very first, by the way, that I ever did this too. And you can see, I wasn't quite sure what I was doing. I even cut out little holes for the frames. Um, it got simpler. <coughs> and for some reason, these right angle cuts got, became associated with entry points, people moving into, into the frame, or relating to doors. There was another kind, which I called excisions, which a lot of people and critics often make this mistake of saying, well, I've excised the eyes. Excision, obviously, is related to blind, again, blindness and the removal of the eyes. But in fact, they always point to the ear, not to the eye. I think that's important. It's important to me because the ear is the receptacle of the word. And it's the word that creates the blindness, you might say. Probably the best known are the, my tabula rasa cuts. I called them. I, that was a term that I came up with quite a way into the series. And for some reason, again, I still haven't been able to work this out. The person looking at the tabula rasa always has to look rather pleased. Um, and also, they, they tend to be in uniform a lot. And I don't know quite why, but, uh, and I still haven't figured out that. But they do seem to work best like that. The title itself actually came from um, Arvo Pert, um, who wrote a beautiful piece of music called Ar- um, Tabula Rasa, after a period of not being able to write. Uh, I do make occasional variations on this. This, uh, this was an attempt at a rather more dramatic Tabula Rasa. Um, and uh, he couldn't write, and so he was using the metaphor of the Tabula Rasa, of the, of the artist confronting this empty canvas and the drama of it coming into the studio and, and the horror of the of this empty canvas and what am I going to do? And I always felt really pleased about this because I don't ever have that problem. I never start with an empty canvas. I start with an image, always. Um, and I, I, I've never understood... This is, I think, why I found it so difficult as a student um, studying painting at the Slate, was I couldn't get fascinated by things in general, by a project of an idea or a hypothesis of an idea. I had to have the actual image I couldn't be fascinated by anything but an actual image. It had to be there already. So I have these sort of imaginary studio images. I sort of imagine a studio. These are scenarios of a studio that I don't possess. I do actually have a studio, but I never go there. I store things. It's full of old stuff. I can't bear to go anywhere near the place, to be honest. Yeah, and then there are circular cuts. And I'm not going to go through all... Well, I am going to go through all the cuts by the looks of it, but I'll do it very quickly. Um, the circular cut, I always relate to the spotlight, I suppose. All these things, they, in a different way, could be related to cinema itself. You know, the projector beam for the excisions, um, the circular spotlights, the tabula rasa could be the empty screen as much as the empty canvas. And this... When it, when it, it's actually quite difficult to do them. 
you know, I, I can I, in, say in an afternoon, I might cut half a dozen circles into photographs. But it's amazing. There's only two or three of these that exist that work, as far as I'm concerned. So there's a lot left over that I don't use. And so I mobilize those into using them as apertures to combine with other images. These I call spheres. Well, there are different sets. I, I produced this after I had a couple of rather nasty periods in hospital in the last year or two. And this I, I produced as a sort of humorous um, kind of recollection of one of those periods. Somehow, whenever I was visited in the hospital by a doctor, there was always a whole team. I hope you don't mind. I brought my students with me. And I, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> of course, delighted. <laughs> And it, uh, there's nothing like being in hospital to make you realize or think about other worlds, after worlds, and so on. You know, people dying around you, and those terrible periods where you're going through really high temperatures, and the reality and the unreality of dreams get mixed up. And... Anyway, it led to this series, <coughs> series called Spheres. There's another series called Bubbles, which is slightly <coughs> related to it as well. Another of the apertures I've, I used, this is a um, piece that, that came from 2007. And actually there was an earlier piece using this sort of flash thing, which related to advertising. But in 2007, it had a different meaning. I, I, have, I had a young son at the time, he's now grown up. But um, he was probably, what, about four or five at the time he was just going to school, at the time of the, um, the terrorist attacks in, in London. And uh, some people that I knew were... were actually very much affected by this. And uh, so he got to know, I was try, uh, trying to shield him in a way, partly from the reality of all this, but he did this drawing which really touched me, uh, uh, in which he drew the house, you know, in a house sort of shape, and then a, a road going like this, and then school, another house shape. And in between this flash, like this. So it, it inspired a new series. And this, as you can see, is a tabula rasa type cut, which has been mobilized for a different use. Triangular cuts have also been used. Um, and actually, this is the beginnings of what I call my donor collages. Um, the donor figure in folk mythology is a person who is both in the story and the narrator of the story. So if you're telling a story about your own life or whatever, you are in fairy tale Folk, folklore analysis, a donor figure. You're both, you, you straddle two worlds. You straddle the world of your audience and the world that you're talking about. And the reason I use the word donor is because of the, the position in medieval painting of the donor of the painting. Very often the person who paid for a painting will be rewarded by being included amongst those venerating the, the sacred figure in the foreground. So they often were slightly ambiguous wearing sometimes contemporary dress in biblical times or something like this. But for me, the donor figures was always... The, the game for this series of collages was always to have one figure that continued from one image to the, the other. So in this case, it's the interrogated man. The others being fragmented. It's particularly influenced, and I should have brought the slide really, by a Fra Angelica painting of um, the mocking of Christ in which all the figures have been reduced to fragments apart from Christ who stands. No, is it the flagellation of Christ? Actually, I'm not sure. Yeah, flagellation. No, no, the mocking of Christ. Yeah. The, there's a, quite a number of children at the centre of these. Um, and I, This is the only one I could find actually, but there are more. So the figure in looking at the incongruity of wearing gym shoes in this case is the, is the donor figure. And th th that led me into another thing. As each time I'm working on these series, something happens that leads me into another digression. This was the enlarged head. I've been reading a book on Picasso. I've become fascinated by Picasso in recent years. And... Uh, his interesting caricature. There's a book written about his fascination with caricature. And I began to be really interested in this, this uh, 
the enlarged heads in caricatures in relationship to the body and how that relates to the child and to the doll to, and to uh, the ventriloquist dummy. And I don't know whether it's, some of you may have seen the, the Hayward show that I was in recently um, in which I showed some of my ventriloquist series. This is part of that, in which you get again the, in this case, a sort of, there's a burglar coming into the room, there's a woman looking out of the, a window, um, combined to create this sort of strange in and out figure. Going right back to um, the beginnings, really, as I see it, this is the very first film still and postcard collage. Um, and in 78, when I produced this, surrealism was probably about the most taboo thing you could be interested in at the time. It was the stuff of cigarette adverts and so on. It was, um, it was really the most debased of, of all things. And it was difficult. I still, when I look at this now, I still think I was holding surrealism at a sort of arm's length, kind of ironic distance still here. The obvious reference to, to Magritte was there. But by 1980, two years later, I was already deeply immersed in this, and I was giving courses on surrealism. And actually looking at surrealism in relationship to, the, particularly to the British Romantic tradition. And this is, this is actually a piece that's very much based on a poem by, by Byron called The Prisoner of Chillon, that wonderfully picturesque looking um, castle there was actually a dungeon um, in which a very famous Republican, Swiss Republican prisoner was let, kept for the whole of his life. And he famously returned to the dungeon voluntarily after being released because he couldn't bear the multitudinous... He was overwhelmed by the world outside. He needed the, sanct, the, the sanctuary of, of um, sensory deprivation. Byron's idea is that, that art comes out of blindness out of sensory deprivation. It's an idea that interests me a great deal. I'm not going to get, we don't have time for me to go fully into it. But it's interesting because he came to this, Byron came to this, by, on a he was sailing with Shelley and they nearly capsized just near the, the, the castle. And it was when they were being taken ashore and saved that they heard this local legend about the prisoner of Chillon. And he wrote this epic poem called The Prisoner of Chillon on his return to to London. And um, of course, Shelley later died in just such a boating accident in Australia. So there's, a, there's a feeling of foreboding about the whole thing. It was also this particular vantage point on Chillon also was actually um, Corbet's favourite vantage point. He, used to, he was reduced late in life, um, Corbet, to painting tourist scenes of Chillon and the picturesque mountainsides because when he lived in exile at, um, in Switzerland. Um, so there's a sort of layering of history in this, which, which interests me. I hadn't even noticed, but a critic did point out that the lampshade has got all sorts of references to, the, to nautical things. Monsters like whales and leviathans and shipwrecks as well. Um, the, the idea of the postcard on the film still always struck me as being something like kind of the spatial world within or on top of the temporal world, the time, the time image, to use a Deleuzean phrase. The space image on the time image. Though it actually my choice of postcards early on could also be seen as time images, I think. Waterfalls like this. And they also tended to be from the past. So if you like, the, the main film still image probably tended to be 1940s, 50s or whatever. But the postcard always tended to be Victorian or Edwardian, quite a bit older. A world that's somehow behind in time as well as in space. This, these are all part of a series of uh, courtroom drama images, which I found a whole cache of them. And I called the series um, The Trial. It's interesting to consider now because I've done a lot of, I have a huge collection of trial images. It's one of my favorite things to use for the trial because it's, it's great because it's always an interior in which some exterior event is un, unfolding. So I, I love them for that reason. And I love watching them actually, old, old movies, particularly courtroom dramas. 
Um, I thought of what I was doing in those, and this kind of idea is somehow trying to decelerate the film image, still it, or even find a point of return within it. And I did a series that was very much meant to be a kind of homage to my hero in collage, Joseph Cornell. And these are part of that. I thought of Cornell as, as very much involved with these worlds within worlds. Often he calls them his habitats where the, with, in which birds feature. I'm particularly fond of his owl series. Um, I did my own homage, some, several homages to, to Cornell. This is one of mine. This is another. I did notice that, I, that whenever I was using um, uh, postcards, they tended to be apertures. And uh, the, re the way I came about noticing this was because I suddenly realized I'd shifted over nearly a decade. I'd suddenly gone from apertures to, to rocks. To I mean, there's still an aperture here, but somehow the figure is something that has been seen through the rocks. And there was this particular, not this one actually, this one, um, really had an effect on me. I, ha I had to go for some x-rays um, a while back. And uh, I produced this work, and I realized that this was an anxiety about my forthcoming x-ray. <laughs> um, and I did a bit of research into x-rays, and I, I discovered that x-rays were discovered in the very same summer that Freud claims to have discovered um, psychoanalysis, um, or the unconscious. And I thought, how interesting. Two, the kind of seeing through the body, seeing the skeletal structure of the body, or obstructions, or whatever, opacities where there should be transparencies. And then there's this idea of, in other words, of, of the transparency of the body in x-rays. And then there's the transparency of the mind in, in, in Freud. Um, anyway, it, I think, I can't remember, it was 1915, the summer of 1915, was this moment of revelation. It was also significant, I thought, because it was right in the middle of the First World War. Um, This is another, this is the first of my mask series. Um, I put a postcard over publicity portraits a, a couple of years later than I did with film stills, and there's a very good economic reason for this. The portraits, bromide portraits of film stars, were a great deal more expensive. I mean, I think they were being, I was being charged five pounds for a, for a portrait, whereas I, I was able to get a film still for about 50p, that sort of comparison. Uh, suddenly they realized that they were as bountiful as the film stills and they came down in price. And by 1980, I was able to start working with them. But I, I think, find it extraordinary now when I think that my entire film still collection was probably about that thick at that time. Uh, probably 50 or 60 I worked from, and that's all. I mean, I now have two, well, two, two huge rooms, absolutely, full of them. Um, I can't remember how many hundreds of thousands I have now, but it's... But this was, anyway, one of the, that was the first mask. I'd been reading Elias Canetti's essay on masks, in which he says, masks show us much, but they hide much more. His point being that the point of a mask is not what is revealed on the exterior of it, but is what is concealed behind it. And not, not, it doesn't mean the face of the particular mask wearer. He means that abstract space of everyone that is, that is concealed behind it, the unknowability of another. Um, and that, that's what is terrifying about masks. And that was the power that I really wanted to harness in, in this series. And I tended, I've, only this, retrospectively, I, 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 I work in a completely intuitive way. I hadn't worked any of this out. But it did occur to me much later that I was using classic images of interiority, caves, forests, ruins. In fact, actually, the three spaces that Bachelard describes as embodying what he calls the dialectics of inside and outside that can inspire reverie in space. Something, a punctuated 
ex um, interior is classically what inspires a reverie, according to Bachelard. And these were the spaces I dominantly used. They had to be recesses, images of sources. They were metaphors, in a way, of, the, of what you might call an interior space. And like, as in, in Freud's idea of psychoanalysis, there is a sense of, of looking through the image. So they're both a sort of a masking, a hiding, and an encouragement to, to look through. And I've begun to realize that in some ways they're like delaying that sense of looking through. Again, it's another way of interrupting the transparency of the image and moving the image from something you look through to look at. Or at least there's a suspension of that looking through or seeing through. I don't know, something like that. I've always been trying to finish this series. So um, actually, uh, Canetti says something very interesting. He says that the mask is the presence of death in in life, and that's how ritual begins. The moment that somebody wears a mask, you know you're in ritual space. Um, you're no longer in the ordinary, everyday reality of the tribal culture. You are then in the space of theatre, um, the space of the gods, where the ancestors. And it's only by masking that the person can become a god, can become the figure that he is representing. And uh, Canetti says the, the, the mask itself has to be what he called an end state, a point of fixity within flux. Something we're, in face-to-face -face contact, we're always in relationship to facial flux. And it's very important into face-to-face -face contact. The moment there is fixity, there is the sense of death. Um, and I felt similarly that each of the masks, I wanted to be the last one. I had to, be the, I had to find a way of finishing them. So when I started to realize that I was making these interiors, like the caves and cr the crevices and all that sort of thing, as metaphors of interior, I thought, I'll blast it through with these other formations. And that's the end of them, because then there isn't the interior any longer. You're looking straight through. It's another transparency. So it kind of was another attempt to end the series. But it, it didn't sort of work out, actually, because then I returned to the next stage with a sort of veiling thing. And most recently, oh, Sorry, I thought I'd put my most recent one in. I haven't. Um, this is the opposite. The marriage piece, pieces are completely the opposite for me. These are all about mobility, facial flux. And where the mask series for me are kind of interruptive things that I do. And I don't know quite how I do them either. I know exactly how I go about these. Um, and in fact, they, they continue. They keep going on and on. There's an ongoingness about them. So, for example, when, when I've cut this male portrait in half to put it onto the female portrait, there's the other half still. And I won't rest until I find a marriage for the other half. And so it keeps on going on and on and on. Um, and there is a wonderful feeling of continuity. I don't feel as I'm in control of this series. It's, it's making itself in a really strange way. Um, this is my... Grayson Perry. <laughs> I do also do combinations of females, which I call she, and combinations of male, which I call he. The she's are the most difficult ones to do, and I've been focusing on those. I don't know why they're so difficult. I think it's because of the cosmetic mask. You've already got a mask to deal with. I, well, I feel a bit like a Frankenstein when I'm doing these because I, 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 I love these people that I create. I really do fall in love with them. Um, and they feel vulnerable and more human than the original images, which are rather kind of, you know, standard publicity, glamour images. But somehow the combination gives them a, a kind of vulnerable quality. Sometimes it goes over the edge into comedy and I can't quite take it. When I, I actually, when I, first, I got really excited by these when I first started producing them, I went mad and I produced hundreds of them. They didn't all work and they all got dismantled in the end. But it was too late because I'd used up all my head portraits and all I'd got left in my collection were three-quarter views. And the moment I started using three-quarter views, it seemed to have a different feeling entirely. They seemed very camp and comic. So I put them aside for nearly a decade. I couldn't bear them. I thought they were just stupid. And then I realized that there was this thing in the back of my mind. I kept thinking about them. 
So I had to bring them back out, and they became a separate series. I called them betrayals, mainly because um, tra transvestites, transsexuals, are said to be betrayed by their hands. I also thought betrayal comes after marriage. I don't do very many of these, actually. It was a very small period. I left them aside. I often end series by making it into a joke. And that was my thought. I was going to end the series. But I didn't want to end them in the end. And most recently, I've been working on a, a kind of show which is a big homage show to, to Picasso. A, number of a lot of contemporary artists all being invited to homages to Picasso. And uh, the organizer had, had spotted that, that um, a lot of my marriage pieces came out of an attention that I'd been paying to Picasso's film, uh, well, Picasso's 1940s portraits, which were inspired by film and uh, glamour photography. <coughs> and this is a contribution, I'm, uh, so it's one of my re most recent she's. I'm still trying to get there with the she's. Anyway, I wanted to, I know I'm, we're getting close. Oh, gosh. Okay, right. Uh, well, I'm going to zoom through this very fast then so we can open up questions. This is just to introduce my very latest work. Uh, this is a piece from 1979 called The Voyeur. <clears throat> and I call it The Voyeur because it was actually a publicity image, as you can imagine. The man's looking out at you, but in fact it seemed through the cutting out to reverse, as though he's looking through a little hole in that wooden fence, like a voyeur. And um, it's part of a series that I call Dark Stars. This is Dark Star One. And then when I went, came back from New York in 1979, I went into colour on these. This one was interesting because I was in the process of making this. And if you can imagine, this is from a magazine in which there were colour images on both sides of the same piece, of, on the same page. And as I turned this figure over to apply the adhesive, I saw that thought, aha, much more interesting. So I stopped there and called it Recto Verso. And that opened up a whole new series of work in which I worked blindly by cutting on the back of the images I was incising. This is called shadow. I became very interested in the idea of, the Jungian idea of shadow. I started to sort of transfer my affiliation from Freud to Jung, I thought uh, shadow was a very much more interesting way of describing what Freud called the unconscious. Every action has a shadow. Uh, um, just that, like, anyway, I won't go into that. This is a very interesting piece for me, because this piece, the Queen Victoria thing behind, was my first appropriated image. I appropriated it at the age of two. And what happened was, there was a big leather-bound book, which was a sort of biography of, of Queen Victoria, published in her, at her death, which was sort of treated a bit like a family heirloom and was given by my grandparents to my, my parents. And as a child, I scribbled in wax crayon all over it, including this image. I was made to feel deeply ashamed about this vandalism. But as a result of the vandalism, I got given the book, which was really... <laughs> So I, this, was, this, I think, is where it all started for me. And this piece is in the Tate. And what I really love about this is that, that I've actually used the film portrait to cover over all my wax. So I'm redeem, I've redeemed it. And it hangs in the Tate, which is even better. <laughs> anyway, this is a piece, from, again, from 1979, which led me to this idea, which is I wanted to start making silk screens of these. And this exists as a silk screen. Um, in fact, I've kept it in my house all these years, that's my, down in my basement, as a reminder of unfinished business. The idea of projecting shadows, I'm not going to go into the whole thing, the relationship with Jung, I don't think we've got time, but I was very interested in the myth of Dibutades in Pliny's Natural History, which is the, his story about the origins of painting, in which he says Dibutades was the potter's daughter. And she had a lover who was due to go off to the Athenian wars. And on the night before his departure, she drew his shadow cast by the lamp in, their, in her room around and 
the contours of his shadow before he left. And this was, according to Pliny, the, the first painting. Um, and this really struck me because I think, in a way, the idea of projecting um, shadows, the relationship with cinema. At the time I did this, this was a decade later, 1989, than the, the, the silk screen from the, the, the collage. I wanted that feeling of bodily presence and absence. And I couldn't get that on the small scale. Anyway, just as a long story, just to introduce my last show in New York, which opened um, just before Christmas, um, in which I have resumed my silk screen. And you'll have the opportunity of seeing some of these in London at the end of February. Not these particular ones, a different set. I got rather carried away. At first, it was just to complete the work I'd started. When I produced this piece, what happened was, it was I slipped a disc so badly that I wasn't able to silk screen print after that at all. And it didn't occur to me, well, I didn't have the money to employ anybody else to do it. So it was the end of that series. And it's something I've always had in my mind. I wanted to someday continue. So I have. <clears throat> and these are from the New York show. And this is maybe what I might show at the approach. I'm not sure yet. In the installation shots, John, he almost looked like they're montaged on to the image of the room. You get people so used to the idea of cutting and montaging that uh, everything starts to become possibly questionable. Yeah, I am. And I did some double. I, with a failure, I, there are a lot of collages also that, that like this, which are the, you know, the shadow collages as well. And all of the ones that were silk screens were also produced as collages. And as always, the ones that didn't work got used in what I call double shadows, which are these pieces. Again, another courtroom drama called The Trial. Trial 3, I think it is. Anyway, so we could have the lights now and questions. We've still got a bit of time for questions. Yes. Yes, I think they, mu they must be. I'm, I mean, I'm never really the. I, I always go think of Maurice Blanchot, who says that the, the writer is probably the last person to be able to interpret their own work. Um, but yes, certainly, I, I, there must be a reason that I'm. That, that my work has got this relationship with the images of the 1940s, 50s, in which there were very definite fixed stereotypes of masculinity and femininity that have since dissolved. I can't work with material since that dissolution. Whether it's an estranged relationship with that or whether in the, I sense the drift of what you're suggesting is that there is a kind of sexist element in them. Um, uh, but I, I really can't tell. I'm not the person to say that, really. Um, but I'm sure you're the person to tell me that. <laughs> uh, one more question? Yes? Um, why do you spend so much time on the shadows? Because they have to pre-exist me. Um, I, I, I've had an incredible distrust, right from when I was a student, of anything that was the result of my own mark-making. I don't know why that was. It became a phobia. I couldn't bear it. And it, especially when I was working with found images, 
I found that the more that I imitated the found images, the found images were always more interesting. So what I found was always much more interesting than I could conspire towards creating. Could you be a found photographer? In what way? I don't know. How would you imagine doing that? Well, I'll try to do that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, right. Oh, well, you have to show me what you do. Sure. Yeah. Very interesting. Please, let me know. Uh, question right up there. Um, I was just wondering if you had any comments about maybe how digital collage has changed. Because when I look at collage and it's about paper, it's like finding the image is part of it. Because what you find is that I know some people um, find like uh, Google and pick out what images they want from the web um, and make them on Photoshop instead. And they just have yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've had to go. I mean, well, at least I, I, I have a sort of another phobia, I'm afraid, which is digital culture in general. Um, I'm a real outcast from this. Um, I, at the Royal College where I taught, I was the last person, actually, to have an office without a computer. People used to come into my office and do a double take. You know, there was a desk without a computer. Um, I don't even use a mobile phone or anything. Um, but it's a bit hypocritical because, to be honest, I have assistants who do all those things for me. Um, <laughs> And, um, and in fact, I use the computer an awful lot. I mean, I communicate with people through the computer. And it's rather nice because I'm working away at my desk, cutting things up, and, my assist and I'm dictating a letter to New York, which is going through. So I do use it. And, and also, it has actually profoundly changed my work because of the way that I find images now uh, online. I mean, all the, my old sources, which were shops I used to go to, are all closed. I have to go online in order to get material. Um, and that made things really, I mean, so much faster. I mean, if you want things, you, and you, can, you can find them so much more easily. On, um, so yeah, um, in terms of digi digital montage, I really hate it. I can't bear it. Um, I can't bear the results, and I have tried. Believe me, I really have. Um, though having said that, a number of those shadow silk screens I used to cut the lists out for, by hand, but now I do it virtually on, on the screen. So, you know, it's changing in all kinds of ways. It's a sort of strange, I, I can't really express, I, let's just say I have a very ambiguous relationship with digital um, culture. Um, I have a young son, who I mentioned already actually, but um, I feel as I'm losing him to digital culture at the moment. <laughs> um, he's going through the teenage period. And I, I'm actually thinking that I may have to get, get a Facebook thing just to, <laughs> just to communicate with him up in the bedroom, you know. <laughs> Can I ask what might have to be the last question connected to that, really? That there's something irrevocable about the cut. And I'd like to hear, you know, is, is this a, a long process where you consider where the cut has to go and then make that irrevocable? No, no, no. No, I, I used to do all that. I used to do Xeroxes of them before and try them out. It, I, I don't know, it just kills the whole process. I, I, I suppose it's because I now have a big enough collection to feel I'm free. Um, but I, I like the bravery of doing it first time. And I like getting the cut over quickly, too. It's sort of one go, and that's it. And it's decisive. And even if what you intended to do with that doesn't work, You've still got the fragments to try with other things. And in fact, actually, as a condition for me, if it works in the way I intended it to, I deeply dis mistrust the result. Um, there has to be at least one digression, and preferably two, to be truly lost from what one was originally intending for something interesting to happen. It has to surprise me at each point. I mean, I love the instantaneity of collage, but also it's often a very slow process, too. You know, you make a cut and you do something, it doesn't work, and you keep trying it out, and it can take years until something actually happens. But when it happens, boom, it's, it's nothing to do with your intentions. It's, it's like it's shifted you into a different dimension. And that's the condition of the, this one. This piece was a good case in point, actually. This is one of those moments where, well, I think hopefully most of the things I've shown you today have been a bit like that. But there are certain ones that have more of a kind of that sense of revelation about them. And this was definitely one of those. I still haven't followed up on this. This is, I call the, these ones like seed images because they're like, 
often they occur, and then it takes a long time for others to sort of crystallize out, like a seed crystal. But they do eventually. Um, I'm still waiting for something to happen out of this one.